When we were last dancing on Sunday, the underdogs were ruling the roost, going six and two versus the spread in rounds one and two of the tournament. I don't count the first four play-in games, needless to say. In rounds one and two, the underdogs had the slimmest margin of victory, going 24-22-2 and two versus the spread. Double-digit dogs, seven and nine versus the odds makers. You had eight outright underdog winners. Well, how have those puppies fared in the round of 16? Well, it really depends on what years you're talking about, because if you go back a couple of years in the 2013 and 2014 tournaments, well, it was the puppies' delight. They were barking left and right, going 12 and 4 versus the odds makers. But the last two years, oh, no, no, no. It was a chalk-eating tournament as the favorites went 13-3 and three versus the number of the past two years. Last year, seven of the eight favorites managed to get the cash. Now, in this video report, I'm going to cover a couple of games that those lines are razor thin. As I'm going to take a look at the games between Michigan and Oregon and Gonzaga and West Virginia. Let's start with that game between Gonzaga and uh, West Virginia in San Jose. Now, we know West Virginia is going to press, press, press because that's what they do best. I mean, they lead the nation in four terms of uh, forced turnovers. And West Virginia certainly looked impressive in its first round win against Bucknell, 86 to 80. And in beating Notre Dame, 83 to 61, denying the Irish a fourth straight round of 16 uh, a third straight round of 16 appearance. But I ask you this, who cares? Because, I mean, they beat Bucknell. They should beat Bucknell. And they beat Notre Dame, okay? I To me, that was more or less a pick em game. Now, Gonzaga did not look good, as we certainly know, trailing most of the first half in their opening round game against, uh, who was it, South Dakota, and uh, blowing a double-digit lead and holding on for dear life against Northwestern. Oh, that was South Dakota State, <laughs> excuse me, South Dakota fans. But uh, this is an interesting contest. Uh, earlier in the day, the line was three. You can now get the uh, Bulldogs down to two and a half. But let's go back to the fact that West Virginia is going to relentlessly try to exert their full court pressure on Gonzaga. I came across some real interesting statistics on how the Bulldogs uh, handled pressure this season. Um, go back to one of their big wins this year in non-conference against Florida. They were pressed 31 times by the Gators. They scored 31 times when they were pressed by the Gators, and they won that game 77-72 in November. They hit 13 of 23 field goal tries on those occasions the Gators pressed them. They only turned the ball over three times. Not too bad. And the Gators are a pretty damn good defensive team. Not nearly as good at exerting pressure full-time as West Virginia, but again, a damn good defensive team. And then I came across another stat. Um, on the season, Gonzaga was pressed 102 possessions. Uh, on those 102 possessions, they were pressed. They produced 125 points. They shot the ball successfully at a 56% clip. And they committed turnovers on just 13% of those possessions. Now, the flip side is this. West Virginia uses a lot of a 1-3-1 to our trap. That's very similar to the same type of zone trap that BYU used. And you know what BYU did in the regular season finale at Gonzaga and handling the Bulldogs, their lone loss of the season. Now, what the Zags are going to do to try to counterattack is, as you know, they use two point guards generally with Nigel Williams, Goss, and uh, Josh Perkins handling the ball. Now, Gonzaga could not play up-tempo when they took on South Dakota State. They could not play up-tempo against Northwestern. West Virginia is going to allow you to run the floor, and that, to me, is going to be the key to this game. Gonzaga, to be successful, has to have a score that's going to be somewhere up into the high 60s, low 70s. It cannot be slowed down, as South Dakota State did successfully, as Northwestern did successfully. Gonzaga needs this game to be a track meet. It needs to be able to exert its pressure on the boards. Gonzaga, a big team. It's going to get most of the rebounds because of its size. 
You know, so West Virginia, not a great shooting team. Now, West Virginia had an outstanding tournament so far shooting the ball. But this is not West Virginia's M.O. We saw West Virginia on the road consistently this season fail to make shots. How we saw West Virginia at home consistently fail to make shots in big time situations. So I'm willing to lay the two and a half points. Do I think Gonzaga is a final four team? I never thought so even when I had my bracket. But then again, I thought Duke was going to win the whole damn thing. But I do think Gonzaga can get by here. And I think right now, because we are getting such exceptional line value in this game, I think the only play to make is Gonzaga in this game. Because if the Zags had played well in their first two round games, and if West Virginia had not mowed down Bucknell and Notre Dame so convincingly, which personally I don't think they did, I think this line would have been four and a half, five points. So to me, getting it two and a half, three, it's a bargain basement price for Gonzaga. And let's remember this team, Gonzaga, I mean, you know, they beat Arizona this year. They beat Florida this year. Uh, who else did they beat that's in the tournament? Well, they beat St. Mary. Hell, they beat St. Mary three times, right home, away, and in the West Coast Conference tournament, all by double digit margins. Um, they beat Iowa State this year in a non conference game as well. Um, so, I mean, they have the pedigree, and I like Gonzaga. The other game uh, you have to ask yourself, is this the time the Cinderella slipper finally falls off Michigan? I'm telling you, don't they remind you of Connecticut from a few years back? I got to ride the Wolverines in this game. Derek Walton, who has really been the catalyst for this winning streak for the Wolverines, had a poor shooting game in their last game out against Louisville, and they still won the game. That's how strong the Wolverines are right now. And during this run, I mean, they are getting contributions from so many key players. And the one thing that I keep coming back to Michigan is that I think the Wolverines kryptonite is when they're going to face a team that is a much better team on the boards than they are, because that's their weakness. The Wolverines are a poor rebounding team. But Oregon is not a very good rebounding team. That's the problem. And Michigan is a much better defensive team than Oregon is. And I don't think Oregon is going to be able to slow down Michigan's tempo in this contest. The Wolverines are going to want to run the ball. And we saw this season when Oregon uh, isn't able to slow down the tempo of opponent, the Ducks have problems. And that's why I like Michigan here. And you know, this game has gone anywhere from Oregon was a one-point favorite to Michigan was a one-point favorite. Now it's back to pick them. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's going to be a close game. And I think it's going to be A game that, you know, Michigan is going to probably get into the high 70s to low 80s. It's going to be a back and forth game in this contest. But ultimately, I think that you've got a Michigan team that is just playing on such confidence, such a role right now. And let's remember this. Michigan actually got on a roll late in the regular season. It wasn't like they suddenly found the magic in the Big Ten tournament. Their role actually preceded the postseason. And it's continued here. And that win when they rallied. To beat Louisville, that was pretty damn impressive, I got to say. And I had my doubts about the Wolverines here in the dance, but I got to think that the clock is not going to strike 12 for them this evening in this one. And, you know, I think that the venue certainly helps them as well. Uh, You know, neither team necessarily has a huge home court advantage here. Uh, You know, Oregon didn't get any favors by the location of this contest. So, again, I think Michigan is the play here because, once more, the game's in Kansas City. Uh, You know, I think right now, if you ask anybody, I think that in terms of um, uh, support in the postseason, you know, everybody loves a Cinderella story. And that's where I think the fan enthusiasm is definitely going to be leaning more towards Michigan. And again, think about Michigan, how they've managed to beat you. Um, You know, in the win against Oklahoma State, they buried the 16 three-pointers. In the upset of Louisville, when they rallied, well, it wasn't really a big upset of Louisville, but when they rallied from uh, the uh, eight-point deficit, you know, with their number one guy struggling from the field, Derek Walton Jr., Um, You know, they were able to work the ball inside. This is a damn good team. They don't commit many turnovers. Um, They are very athletic. They're a good defensive team. And again, Oregon, I think um, a team that allowed what? Rhode Island to score 48 points in the first half. They have some defensive faults. So I'm going to go with the Wolverines here. And uh, the Big Ten has just had an exceptional postseason. 
And it's a torn uh, a conference that I think didn't get a lot of respect, just like the Pac-12 coming into the dance, but they've certainly proven their mettle. So I'm going to go with Michigan and Gonzaga as your two complementary plays. Obviously, my best bet is in the uh, late game, uh, which is, I think, one of the good games, best games on the board today. Obviously, that's why I'm using it uh, between Xavier and Arizona. The other game between Kansas and Purdue, the last time I had a winning play on Kansas, I don't know, years ago. I mean, you know, I'd be tempted to lay the points with Kansas, but it's an interesting matchup because I really don't have a lot of faith in Kansas. And Purdue, I never know what to expect from the Boilermakers one night to another, especially offensively. So, again, Kansas beat up a couple of, you know, lightweights in my estimation to advance to the in the tournament so far. Yeah, lightweights. Cal Davis and Michigan State. Michigan State isn't that good. So the fact that they beat Michigan State by 20 and beat Cal Davis by 38, that really doesn't impress me much, which I think is an old Shania Twain song if you ask me. Uh, And in terms of Purdue, you know, beating Iowa State, okay. Yeah, they had, what, a 24-point lead, and they allowed Iowa State to make a furious comeback to win it finally, 80-76. to And taking care of Vermont in the opener by an 80-70 to score, well, again, that doesn't impress me much either. I think the price is certainly a worthwhile investment in taking Kansas in this game. Because if you look up and down, you know, Kansas – I mean, you know, a five-point chalk in this game. Yes, Purdue has the size and should be able to do great down low, but I worry about Purdue's perimeter game. On the other hand, I think Kansas is the more athletic team and the better outside shooting team, so you have strengths and weaknesses for both. I lean a little toward Kansas, but i got to be honest, I'm not even going to watch that game. I could care less about that one. So that'll do it. I wish you well, guys, and I'll talk to you again on Friday when we do this one more time. Good luck, everybody.